Today we've got some great malicious compliance stories about sticking it to corporate, sticking it to managers. We'll get to that in a bit, but first, corporate said so. Someone posted a pizza story and it's sending me back, so here's a good one from me to you. I used to sling pizza, and I had this one couple who would regularly come in and order a specialty pizza, think meat lovers, but with three times the amount of toppings. Like extra, extra everything. Plus, they would add extra, extra of other toppings that weren't originally on that pizza like olives and onions. So of course, this meant that it never cooked thoroughly, even after sending it through the oven twice plus. Every single time they would complain about the pizza being burnt on the edges and not cooked enough. And it took too long and they also wanted more of the toppings. I tried repeatedly to explain to them that every extra topping you add makes the portion size of all the toppings go down. I don't even understand why we were allowed to add so many toppings on at the register. Anyways, about the fifth or sixth time I replaced the pizza for them because they kept complaining to corporate and received credit, the man came in again and said they spoke to corporate and corporate wants me to make the pizza the way they want it. I knew that isn't true. There really wasn't a corporate customers could call, just a call center and those people did not care. But I decided to do exactly what they asked, but made sure to explain to them that if I made it their way and it didn't turn out well, they wouldn't be getting any more remakes. I took the order and made it as they were expecting. Kind of. I put full portions of each topping on that monster. To say that the pizza was a freaking mountain is an understatement. It didn't even fit in the oven. I had to take toppings off. I did feel a little bad at this point knowing full well they paid with the store credit over $40 for this one pizza and there was no way it would ever properly cook. So I did give it two runs through the oven but that still didn't help. It was pan to pan toppings so getting out of the pan sucked and I just put and cut it right in the box so the toppings wouldn't fall everywhere. After I cut it the slices disappeared under the toppings and you couldn't even see crust so it just looks like a giant pile of trash toppings dumped in a box. I couldn't even close it. I brought it to the customer and he started to lose it on me saying it took too long and it looked like a mess and he wanted another credit. I pulled out his receipt and asked which part wasn't up to par. He said it didn't look cooked and I reminded him how I warned him that with this amount of toppings, I would have cooked it longer if he hadn't been complaining about time. I also showed him the at home cooking time and temps on the box. I showed him the crust underneath and went through all the toppings and extras. Everything was accounted for as he asked for it, so I told him I'd let management and corporate know that it was made to his liking. Never saw them again. I just think this is one of those situations where when that customer gets angry and says they're never coming back, you say to yourself, thank god please don't. I guess if somebody's trying to spend 40 bucks on a pizza you want to try to keep that business, but not if you have to comp them 5 times to get there. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of compliance, why not hit that subscribe button down below? Our next story is Chief of Naval Operations visiting the submarine squadrons 6 and 8 piers. So there I was on a nice afternoon, just after lunch, standing the pier access security watch at Pier 3, Norfolk Naval Base. This would have been about 2002. I was a second class E5 stationed aboard the USS Minneapolis St. Paul. Pier access was pretty simple. Vehicles came through the vehicle access gate with proper credentials. People came through the personnel access turnstile only. I could allow my commanding officer access by visual recognition, but for everyone else, I was required to check, hold in my hand their military ID before allowing access. During our morning muster, we were informed that the Chief of Naval Operations was on base that day, and there was the possibility of him visiting the boats on Pier 3. About an hour into my watch, these two lieutenants, O3, walk up, tell me that the CNO is a couple minutes away, and that I was not to slow his roll by checking his ID. They offered their IDs to vouch for him, and pointed to his photo in my guard shack, indicating that I could identify him based on his photo. I indicated to the lieutenants that my standing orders required me to check ID, but if they would like, they could call the squadron duty officer on the phone in my guard shack to request an exception for the chief of naval operations. They declined the phone call offer and ordered me to pass the chief of naval operations without ID check. We can all guess where this is going, right? 
I replied that their order was not a lawful order and that I must therefore decline to acquiesce. I reminded them that as a watchstander, I represented Commodore, Submarine Squadron 6 and 8, and in this position, I held the authority. At that point, a contractor rolled up in a van. I locked the personnel turnstile to address the vehicle requesting access to the pier. When the van was allowed access to the pier and started driving away, and I was closing the vehicle gate, the chief of naval operations came walking up. I gestured him towards the personnel turnstile, saluted, and requested his ID. He presented his ID, asked me where I was from, how long I'd been in the Navy, etc. The normal friendly small talk you'd get from any flag officer. I returned his ID, saluted, and wished him a good day, ignoring the stink guy from the lieutenants. About 10 minutes later, my chief of the boat, COB Command Master Chief, comes walking up. I expected to be speaking to someone as I watched the Chief of Naval Operations cross the bow of the MSP and I knew those lieutenants would try to stir something up. What I expected was the Chief of the boat to chuckle and say something like, I heard you had a bit of drama with those lieutenants or something like that, especially considering that the Navy was well into the era of procedural compliance above all else. Oh no, the COB was there to chew my butt, have me relieved from watch, and disqualify me from standing watches. This was really bad for me, and for the whole duty section. All the submarine duty sections were stretched really thin due to all the extra security watches required post-2001. We were already working a 24-hour duty day every 72 hours and the Navy also implemented mandatory sleep period requirements for watchstanders, which meant no duty sections had room to lose anyone. While I was pretty flabbergasted, our chief of the boat was part of the new generation of Senior Leadership Academy D-bags, so it wasn't entirely unexpected. After being relieved, I went back to the boat and talked to my chief and department head to no avail. I tried to talk to the chief of the boat and managed to get yelled at some more and score some extra duty on the weekend. The chief of naval operations was still there, so the CO and XO were not immediate options. I asked one of my buddies to stand by for duty section requirements and walked over to squadron HQ and told the squadron duty officer what just happened on the pier. He walked me over to the Commodore's office, left me in the yeoman's office for a second, then called me in. The Commodore listened to what happened, then sent me back out to his yeoman to have a seat. About 15 minutes later, in walks my commanding officer, executive officer, chief of the boat, and the navigator, my department head. I think the chief of the boat is the only one who really knew what was going on. The chief of the boat noticed me in the yeoman's office and gave me a nice look just before we were all ushered in to see the Commodore. The Commodore was impressively proficient at chewing butt and he did it all in front of me. When he was done, he verified with the chief of the boat that all the qualifications were as they were before the incident. The Commodore then asked if all was well with me. Looking at the chief of the boat, I suggested that I may have won this battle, but with two years still left on the boat, I was sure to pull every crap job. The Commodore shook my hand, passing one of his squadron coins. He then wrote his personal cell number on one of the business cards and said if I ever felt mistreated on the boat, I was to call him immediately. When we left, I walked out with the navigator over to McDee's for a coke and to talk about what happened. The commanding officer, executive officer, and chief of the boat left together and I heard the commanding officer yell at the chief of the boat, what the freak was that crap show all about? At the McDee's, the navigator told me that the senior officers were in the wardrobe having coffee with the chief of naval operations and had to cut it short when the yeoman informed the commanding officer that he, the executive officer, navigator, and chief of the boat were needed at the squadron on an urgent matter. When the chief of naval operations heard that, he said, well, I've taken up enough of your time and ended their chat. The MSP was a horrible boat the whole time I was there. Four people ended things in a fifth attempt in the four years I was there. Several people in leadership roles were fired during those four years, including the chief of the boat in this story and his predecessor. Well, considering the loss of life, I sure hope that the people that were overseeing this whole thing did get fired. This whole story went from that's awful leadership to horrendous 
Our next story is new manager, new rules. Okay, boss. This happened a few years ago. I used to work in community-based mental health, which required me to go to people's homes, should, etc. I was almost never in the office, maybe one to two hours a week. The rest of the time I was at home or in the field. My car and couch were my office. Then I got a new manager. First thing they tell me is I can't wear my flip-flops anymore. Okay, don't like it, but okay. They then say I have to be in the office two days a week. Nope, not gonna happen. Not when my job is in the field. Oh, and when I have to be in the office, I have to be in business casual, including a button-up shirt. No jeans. My work attire at this point included jeans, a t-shirt, and flip-flops. Now I'm pissed. So, I go out to a thrift shop and buy two of the ugliest oversized button-up shirts you can imagine. One looked like it was made from a circus tent. I wore that shirt to the office every single time I had to go in. I was let go two months later when COVID hit, cause mental health isn't needed right now. Their words not mine. Plus side is I was able to help most of my former clients find new providers and that office is basically dead. Edit. The dress code prior to the new boss allowed for the attire and I wore that for 5 years roughly. After I was let go I landed a position making almost 50% more than I had been but now working with a significantly smaller caseload. I went from 90 clients to 13. I went from working with all ages to just teens. That's honestly hilarious that when COVID hit they said, mental health isn't needed right now. Obviously OP included that to point out how horrendous that statement is. I mean mental health issues I think spiked worldwide during COVID. People being cooped up in the house all day, things being cancelled, no places to go, not many places open. It was an awful time for mental health. That said, our final story of the day is, careful what you ask for. Not sure if this qualifies? I used to work at an internationally known pizza establishment. Think a big old rectangle and pips right out of high school. At some point, they did a complete overhaul and added fun new features like pizza tracking and being able to rate and review and comment on your order online, so long as you ordered online. Each shift, the manager on duty was tasked with going through the reviews and following up on any of the negative comments that came in during their shift. One night I was cleaning the line when I hear my GM burst into laughter. Being the curious scamp I am, I went to see what he was laughing at. He points to the screen, rolling away from the desk to give me room to read the comment section on an order from earlier in the day, before either of us had arrived. The opening manager, who was the GM's little brother, was interesting to say the least. I don't think he really liked his job, who does when you work in the fast food industry, so he really didn't care if customers complained. As such, he had a tendency to follow orders to an extreme. This is where the malicious compliance comes in. If a customer asked for a light onion, you were lucky to find three pieces of onion on the entire pizza. If you asked for extra, I really hope you like whatever topping you asked for extra of because you're gonna get it. The customer from earlier in the day had ordered a barbecue chicken pizza and asked for extra chicken. It's been almost 10 years and I still remember the feedback he left in the customer comment section verbatim. I know I ordered extra chicken, but I wasn't expecting the whole freaking bird on my pizza. So I'm not gonna lie, if I went to a pizza place and I ordered for extra of a topping, and like, the pizza just was exploded with that said topping, I feel like that would actually inspire me more to be a repeat customer, wouldn't you guys think so? Or should there be a level of respect when you say you want extra of something that you should only have mildly more than the usual amount? Like let's say you really love bacon, you order extra bacon, and this thing has like bacon almost on every inch of the pizza. Are you really going to walk away from that experience going, well that's not what I asked for or well that doesn't make me happy? Guess it depends how much you like said topping, but man, I would be darn happy. I'd, I'd probably make this my go-to pizza place. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another absolutely awesome story of malicious compliance, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. 
That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.